Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks. So um, I'll uh, first introduce who I am, if this will advance. There we go. So um, I'm Dale McMurtry. Um, I'm from CSIRO, which is Australia's uh, national science agency. Um, I'm actually from the Australian eHealth Research Centre, which is a part of, of CSIRO. Um, so we're the, the digital health research um, part of, of our science agency. Um, but this presentation, really, the credit's all due here to Jim Steele, who um, some of you or many of you may know. Um, so he, uh, he created this presentation originally, which has been presented at DevDays before, but it's a really good introduction to uh, FHIR and terminology and the terminology services. So um, it seemed like a good idea to, to go through it again. So uh, yeah, all of this work is, is really his. Uh, so what, what will we go and cover today? Um, essentially this, rather than going through operation by operation and resource by resource, which can be pretty dry, uh, Jim created this this presentation, which really takes a more of a, a journey approach, uh, at using um, the, the the Wizard of Oz, which uh, hopefully at least many of the people will know, uh, might be familiar to to many people, um, which is a, a book which is over 120 years old now. Um, so we take this fictitious journey through um, a healthcare encounter um, and and try to have a look at where terminology is used in fire and, and how it's used throughout that journey. So particularly how codes are, f are selected, found and selected um, when doing things like data entry. Um, what do they look like when we're sending them around in, in fire resources? Um, how do we validate data that we receive and make sure that the coding is, is correct and valid for the, for the, uh, the message that's being sent or the, the, the resource? Um, and then how do we query this data once we've gone and recorded all this information, we want to do analytics, you know, how, how do we do that? Um, so I, I think probably it's worth noting though that, that yeah, terminology is a fairly important part of FHIR. I mean, obviously it's close to my heart because I do a lot of terminology in, in the past, but um, it, it really carries a, a very big chunk of the meaning of the fire resources. So if you think of a condition, um, really the, the coded bit of the condition is really carrying a lot of the, uh, the meaning, so um, or meds or, or whatever it might be. Um, and it's very like the rest of fire, the resources themselves, but there's a you know, very specific op operations and it very heavily relies on those operations, which we'll, we'll go through. So the fire terminology resources. So it all sort of starts, I suppose, with code system. So the code system resources, as you imagine, it it's represents a code system and, and the content of the code system, which is really a, a set of codes that have some sort of coherent meaning. Um, they might have, um, and many do have a hierarchy that go with them as well. Um, typically, a code system resource is also going to carry the the metadata that you might associate with a code system. So how do we identify this thing? What's the URI for it to identify it? Versioning, um, even things like copyright, uh, who, who publishes it, all of those kinds of um, bits of metadata. Then they, they also declare um, properties, so properties for the codes, and you can have filters declared um, for those properties so that we can we can filter the code system using those, those properties. And then obviously it has concepts, which are the, the content of the code system. Um, each one of those will have a code, uh, it'll have uh, a display, it can have other designations as well, which can be used for synonyms, um, other names, translations, language translations, that sort of thing. The next thing to, to think about, and these are really the three main resources, there are others, but we'll focus on these main resources, uh, is value set. So a value set, um, its purpose is to select a set of codes from one or more code systems. So a value set can span code systems. Um, typically, they tend to be just one code system, but there's plenty of valid use cases for, for spanning code systems as well, um, which we could, could get into. And it, it's, they're context bound. So it's saying this set of codes from this code system have been collected together uh, in a value set for a particular reason or a use case, and that context is, is important. And then really the rest of the picture um, is, is concept map, is the bit that sits in the middle. Um, so when we want to be able to uh, correlate codes from two different code systems to each other and say that there's some relationship that exists between those, uh, we can use a concept map to do that. It's mapping from a value set to a value set, and that's quite uh, deliberate, which is saying that the, that the map itself 
has a particular context and it's mapping from the code from the, the source code as it appears in the value set and the context that is applied to the value set. Um, so that it's not just that code from that code system, it's that code in the context of that value set um, to a, a one or more target codes that again are in the context of a value set. And so uh, one of the, what I think is great things about FIRE is how uh, explicit it is about that, that that context really matters in terms of those maps and it calls that context out um, as, as being an explicit thing. Um, you can also see here uh, that there's a, you know, effectively you can think of a concept map like a table of source, relationship and target. Um, the relationship can be a, one of a number of different relationships. So you can say that these two things are equivalent to each other in the context of this map. Um, you could say these two codes, um, this code is, has a broader meaning than this code in the context of this, of this map. Um, you could just say that these two things are related to each other in some way. It might not actually be a, some sort of subsumption or equality um, relationship or equivalence relationship. Uh, the other thing to note here is the ends on the, on the diagram. So that's really trying to indicate that value set and, and code system are, are normative. Um, a concept map is not, uh, and in fact, in R5, it, it has gone through some relatively significant changes. Um, and whereas code system and, and value set have been relatively stable for, for a while now. Um, but of course, as I mentioned before, um, operations are, are really important in the context of, of these fire uh, terminology service resources, and it's really how you use the terminology services. Um, so code system has lookup, um, which is really tell me about this code, tell me about the, the, what, what you know server about this particular code. Uh, validate code is really asking, is this code um, part of this code system? And you can also give it uh, like a, a display and say, is this a, a valid display for this code in that code system? Uh, subsumes is telling you about the hierarchical relationship between codes. So you can say, here's two codes. Um, I want to know, are these things, does one subsume the other? Um, are they unrelated to each other? Uh, so you can ask those sorts of questions of a, of a code system. A value set, uh, so value set has two main operations, uh, expand. Expand can say, uh, okay, given the definition of a value set, and a value set may be defined as just an enumeration of codes, or just a, a list of codes, or it can also be defined uh, based essentially on, on rules. Um, uh, and that more rule-based definition of a value set is actually um, uh, a fairly powerful way of, of, um, of maintaining a value set membership. But of course, when you want to uh, find out, well, what are the codes that match the rules that define this value set? Uh, you can run the expand operation. Uh, you can also uh, provide other parameters to further filter that down to look for a code in, a, in a, uh, a value set as opposed to just tell me what all of the codes are that make up this value set. Uh, and then there's validate code again. Um, so validate code in context of a value set is saying is this code in this value set? Um, and, and similarly you can do things like validate the display term for that. And then there's uh, concept map. So concept map has uh, these two operations. Translate uh, is just how you use the value set. So you, you can say to translate here, I've got this code. Uh, tell me what this code maps to uh, in, this, in this concept map. And you can, get, uh, you can get the answer back to that. Um, closure is a really a, more, a slightly more complicated operation, which is really asking it about the, the server, about the hierarchical relationships between usually a, a set of codes. Um, and I've got an example later in this, which hopefully we'll get time to go through, which will explain a little bit more about what closure is. So in terms of uh, the terminology APIs in, in a general fire architecture, there's a few options. There's like everything, there's not necessarily a right or wrong. Um, so you can first think of it, uh, the simplest approach is that your terminology uh, APIs are handled by whatever your fire resource server is, your standard resource server. Um, that's nice and simple and easy for the client. Uh, and in many use cases, that's, that's more than enough. Um, there's really where you would go to from that is um, because you might need some more advanced terminology capabilities that the, that the fire resource server may not, may not be able to provide. Um, so the next, the next option is to go with a separate terminology server. So um, your application still has to talk to the fire resource server and now it has to know about another endpoint, which is the, 
the uh, the terminology server and um, be able to to communicate with that when it's wanting to query um, uh, terminologies. Often that's used for data entry type use cases. Um, the the, the terminology server as well in that setting can be used to host terminology for multiple uh, applications. So it doesn't just have to be bound to the use of one particular resource server or application. It can be a you know more general purpose, um, single source of truth um, for, for many systems. But then obviously there's an issue here with being able to make sure that you're synchronizing or you're covering what you need um, in terms of content for the fire resource server and the terminology server so that they're that they're actually talking the same versions of the of the code system or have those um, all of those resource versions available um, then there's a another option to to put a facade in front of that so that effectively to the application uh, it just looks like it's talking to one endpoint that uh, knows how to do all of the things it needs. So the, the scrud operations that a resource server might provide, as well as the, um, the terminology services, uh, and then use the facade to mediate that between the, um, the two applications in behind. Uh, that makes it nice and simple for the application, but obviously is a little bit more complicated to engineer behind. Um, and then the final, oh, you similarly have the same issue, obviously, to make sure that you've got the right content loaded across those two different servers because you've got two different places dealing with, with terminology there. And then ultimately, um, you know, the, the nirvana of having a, uh, a, a fire server, a resource server that's got integrated fire terminology services, um, and it's presenting that one uh, interface to the, uh, to the application, but it can also make use of those uh, complex uh, terminology services to be able to support things like terminology uh, aware search for resources and, and you know, more advanced validation. Um, and obviously that can also support um, multiple servers. It, it's, it, usually you end up with one terminology server supporting a, you know, a number of, of applications in one particular ecosystem. So anyway, on, on to the journey. Um, so the journey starts with, with Dorothy, Dorothy, who I don't know uh, if everyone knows the story, but uh, Dorothy's had a bit of an accident um, and she's not feeling great. So she, she decides to make an appointment to see uh, Dr. Oz, her GP. Uh, in, in doing so, she's going to fill out a, a pre-appointment form um, in, in this fictitious encounter. Uh, and in doing that, she's, she's filled out some basic demographics. So her age, gender, um, the reason for, for visit, so you can see here she's searched for and found um, accident caused by tornado um, as the, the reason she's maybe not feeling so great. Um, and then she's also provided some information there about um, some uh, other family members or, or friends in this case that have conditions that might be relevant to, to her, um, her uh, particular condition. Um, so we'll go through and have a look at how the terminology server has supports each one of these these bits. So the first simple example is uh, is gender. So how does the application know what options to provide for gender? So we can use uh, the expand operation um, on value set, and we're specifying uh, the URL because the application knows this is the the identifier effectively in Fire of of the value set resource that it needs to expand to get the options to, to provide to uh, someone filling out the, the gender. Um, and so the response that comes back is actually a value set resource. This is one of those strange things in Fire in that you've got uh, this sort of split personality and value set in that the value set can represent the definition of a value set where it will have a, a compose element that specifies either the list of codes that are in it or the set of rules that need to be evaluated to determine the codes that are in the value set. Um, and in this case, it can also be a response, um, which is an expansion, which in contains the, the set of codes that are, are valid for the expansion of the value set given the parameters that have been passed to the server. Now, in this case, we haven't passed it any parameters other than the value set. So we're saying, just tell us what, what, are, what codes are in this value set. But we can filter that down and we'll, we'll have a look at that in, in uh, an example. So the next example, and this is one of my, my favorites, is um, where we're asking the, the terminology server to expand uh, a value set so that we can uh, fill in a particular element. Um, but instead of the client 
knowing which value set to use for that, we're, we're actually saying this is the, uh, the context for this particular um, uh, value set expansion, where we're saying this is the element that we're going to try and fill in, the family uh, member history relationship. Um, terminology server, you've got the structure definitions, you know what's bound to that. Expand whatever the right value set is and give me the response, is essentially what we're saying. Which means that the, the client doesn't need to have all of that configured into it, um, which you can sort of decouple that and, and configure that into the terminology server, which is, which is quite nice. And they, this can work with profiles as, as well, obviously. It doesn't just have to be the base specification. Um, and so the same thing comes back. It's a value set uh, resource with an expansion. Uh, interestingly, in this, uh, you, you can see there that it, it includes the URL of, of the value set that actually got expanded. So now we know uh, what, what is bound to that element. Um, and you can see here it's returned 105 uh, total uh, codes that, that are in this particular value set. So the next example uh, is where Dorothy was trying to uh, enter the reason uh, reason for her visit. Now this, we're going to use the same method of using a, uh, the context of saying we're trying to fill in the reason code in the encounter resource. Um, but now we're providing, it's not really practical to say to it, give me all of the, all, all of the, uh, the codes that, um, that are in this particular value set and I'll figure out client side how to deal with rendering that because this can be, for this value set, could be hundreds of thousands of codes. Um, so what we're doing is saying, well, Dorothy's typed ACC space TOR um, and we're saying to the, the terminology server, you, given that, you go and figure out what the most relevant codes are from that value set uh, and return them to me in a relevance ranked order um, so that I can render them to, um, to the user. And what's happened here is the, uh, the server's come back and said that there's a total of six codes that are, are relevant for that. It's obviously figured out which value set to use and expanded that. Um, and the, the top uh, result here is um, accident caused by tornado. Um, and you can see the second one, the accident caused by, uh, uh, caused directly by welding torch. So she's obviously not gonna pick that. It's the accident caused by tornado and, and she selects that option. Um, so terminology servers uh, have algorithms that are used to determine how to determine what is the most relevant. Um, and obviously the, it, we can't standardize those necessarily and there's, there's a lot of complexity behind how they, how they work and can introduce things like stemming to, to try and make sure that those results are, um, are, are accurate. But the benefit of that is then clients don't have to re-implement all of that and, and even have all of that content to know uh, how to filter that down to the, the appropriate things to show to the user. Um, so once we've got all of that information and we're, we're wanting to uh, record that, uh, we've recorded that in the database, we're wanting to, to, um, to send that as a, as, a, as a resource. So the, the result of this particular thing, there might be a few resources involved. There'll be a, a patient resource, obviously, um, and there'll be some family history, um, family member history resources. There'll be a, an encounter resource. So this is an encounter resource and really this is just to look at the places where coding is recorded in resources and what they look like. So you can see up here first up there's the status element which has got the planned uh, code in there. So there's, uh, you can see here there's, there's nothing saying what code system that comes from. That's because the specifications already narrowed that down to say that this particular code must be from this code system. There's no need to re-say it because that's the only code system that could be could be used in that in that particular code element. And that's what code elements look like. Um, the next ones are coding. So uh, coding is a bit different because it can be bound to a value set um, in the specifications uh, and, and profiles. It could be from a number of different code systems. So uh, we have to specify in the coding the system that the codes come from and obviously the code itself, otherwise we're not saying anything. You can also add other things like uh, the other elements in here that are optional, like the, the display. Um, uh, also something like user selected, which you can see further down, which is indicating whether this code was, was actually selected by a user or uh, was added because of some um, generated mapping or, or other algorithm. And then uh, we've got the codable concept uh, element and data type, which is 
actually very, very common, um, and you'll see this quite a bit. So it has the capability of supporting multiple codings um, and as well as a, a text representation of the code. So the text representation without the codings can be used where there's no coding that can be found that's appropriate for what the person is trying to say. Um, in this case, we're saying that accident caused by tornado is the, the text, um, but it's also the code that was, that was picked and that code was user selected um, by, the, by the human. It's not some generated map or, or something that, that was added. Um, we can also do things like specify the version in there um, if that was important to the code system and there's, there's other you know, um, elements that can be used there. So um, it gets around to, to Dr. Oz to, to have, have his appointment with Dorothy and um, he gets the, the information that she's already provided um, in that uh, pre-appointment form already pre-populated, so the demographics and the, the reason for the visit, etc. Um, and he goes through and the first thing he's, he's going to do is uh, um, indicate what her housing status is because social determinants is quite important to overall health. Um, so he's uh, made a record here that the patient is homeless um, and he's also made a number of, of diagnoses, recorded diagnoses. So concussion with loss of concentration, uh, with, with loss of consciousness, um, has imaginary friends and um, pleasant fantasy. And these are actually all real SNOMED CT codes. Um, I've used SNOMED CT in this example and there's some other ICD bits as well. It doesn't have to be um, the fire APIs or this fire terminology services is obviously more general than, than just um, SNOMED, but this is what I've used in this example. And then ultimately he's referring Dorothy on to um, Dr. W. W. West, um, who's a clinical psychologist for a, an evaluation. So in terms of him selecting the, the housing status, um, in this case, uh, the housing status is actually going to come from a, a LOINC answer list. And um, this is interesting because what's being expanded here isn't an explicit value set. So there's no value set resource with the URL um, that's, that's shown there. Um, this is uh, what's called an implicit value set. So because the terminology server has uh, LOINC loaded into it, uh, there's a definition in the specification for a number of the code systems, so SNOMED CT, LOINC, Bucom, Marx Norm, for implicit value sets. Um, so that, that those value sets, um, un, your eyes are known to the server, the terminology server, without you having to create an explicit value set to define what those are. Um, and this is a, a particular one for an answer list for LOINC. But when we expand it, um, it's exactly the same as if we had have expanded an explicit value set. The, the, the response is, is the same and it, it doesn't really matter um, how that's defined to the client. So we can see here, yeah, there's a, there's a number of different um, options there that come back from that value set, that answer list. Um, selecting the diagnosis, those SNOMED codes that, that I mentioned before. So this is a similar um, example in that it's a, uh, an implicit value set again. Uh, it's a SNOMED CT implicit value set. Uh, that's defined as everything that's a, a subtype of the clinical finding concept, um, which is what that, that URL means. And part of the specification for FHIR, there's a um, using SNOMED CT with FHIR uh, page, which specifies how these implicit value sets work. Um, another interesting thing that's going on here is because we know that there's a, going to be a lot of concepts that come back for that, we're specifying in this request that we only want to know about 10 of them. Just send me 10. Um, and the offset is, an, is a way to be able to step through in pages um, if there's you know, many, many results and I want to have a look at the next 10 or the next 10 or I can do it in hundreds or whatever I want. Um, so it's a way of controlling what the response is from the server. We've also said in this case we want the designations to come back. So instead of just sending back the codes and the display terms, we want all the designations as well. Um, there could be many reasons we want that. You can get language translations in those designations. Um, so it's a way of just controlling the, the response. Um, and so you can see here that we've got back um, a total of two um, responses um, and you can see here that there's, uh, there's the, the designations then extended in below the, um, uh, the code itself as well as the display term. So ultimately uh, Dr Oz sends um, his record to, to Dr West after he's recorded all, all of this. And of course, Dr. West's EMR presumably is going to want to validate this content when it, when it turns up. 
um, to make sure that the codes that are in there are the ones that are expected for the, the profiles as presumably some profiles that Dr. West's um, EMR uses. So um, what there's obviously your fire server is going to have some sort of validation um, operation uh, that's going to do much more than just the, the, the codings. There's lots of structure and, and other things to, to validate about the resource. Um, however, then when it gets to the coding, it's usually really the validate code operation on value set that's really determining is the particular code that's in this element, does that match what the binding says for that, for that particular um, structure definition? So um, let's have a look at an example of one of those. So we've got here um, a validate code request that's being sent to this particular, again, implicit value set um, uh, URL. This is a, um, uh, a reference set in SNOMED CT, um, and in fact, it's a clinical finding reference set in the Australian extension of SNOMED CT. Um, and there's just these URL patterns that control that. So we're asking, is this code a member of this value set? And the answer from the server um, comes back as a parameters um, resource, and it's just saying, uh, yes, it is. And the display happens to be um, concussion with loss of consciousness. A uh, slightly more complicated example, um, we can do something like this, which again is the same um, implicit value set, uh, and we're passing this code in, but this time we're passing in the display term that, that was in the, the, um, the resource when it came to us from Dr. Um, Oz's uh, uh, data and, and from, his, from his system. Um, so it has imaginary friends. What's come back this time is uh, a response saying, yes, that code is in the value set, um, but the display term has imaginary friends is not correct, is not the, uh, one of the valid terms um, known for that code. And then it said that the display term is has imaginary friend. Um, so in this case, Dr. Oz has some customization of, that, of the display term for that code, and it's not one of the things that's in the core coding system. Um, obviously, in this case, it's fairly benign. Um, but uh, it, you know, obviously that can be um, quite slippery and quite dangerous if you, you end up with um, meanings that are, are not necessarily quite the same as, as what the, uh, the other display terms that someone receiving that code might interpret that code to mean. So Dr. West um, completes her record. Um, so she goes through and uh, has a consultation. She diagnoses um, Dorothy with, uh, with a few, uh, with a couple of things here, with depersonalization disorder and reactive attachment disorder of infancy or uh, early childhood. Um, and ultimately, um, these are, are SNOMED CT codes as well um, that, she's, that she's selected in her system. But then she also recommends this treatment, which uh, is a proprietary code system that's, that's from her system, this RBSLPTAP3. Um, code system, uh, uh, code for, for treatment. Um, oops. So when um, Dr. West has done that, uh, presumably, so she's, the next step is she's going to submit that off to um, uh, Land of Oz has a, an HIE. Um, so uh, that HIE is going to um, try to uh, translate those, those codes, those diagnosis codes over to ICD for billing purposes. Um, so the HIE have their own map between SNOMED CT and ICD for this particular purpose. There's no real generic map between SNOMED and ICD and, and really these become quite purpose specific things. So this is, this is gone through their map. Um, the first two codes translate uh, okay. Uh, you can see there the concussion code and um, depersonalization, derealization syndrome. Um, but then the next two codes don't. So maybe we'll have a look at, at what's going on there and, and um, what, the, what the resolution to that might be. So um, first having a look at, at, a, um, at a mapping, um, we're going to use the translate operation to use the, the, um, the map that the uh, HIE uh, has. And so we've specified the particular uh, map that we want to use. We've said that the code that we, um, that the target code system, a target value set that we're looking for is all codes that are from the ICD-10 um, uh, code system. That's what that target URI uh, means from value set. And then we've passed in the code. And the response that we get back from the server um, is, is uh, a response that says, yes, true, there, there is a match. Um, there is some sort of match between those codes. Um, 
and it what it's returned here is a, um, a match to the S6 uh, S06.0 uh, code, which means concussion. Uh, and in the context of this map, you can see the relationship that it's that it's saying uh, that exists between those is one of um, equivalence for the purposes of, of this map. So what about the unmapped code? Um, what what do we do about that? Well, probably the first thing to do is to look up the code to see what is this code and, and to try and figure out, well, why why is there no mapping for this particular thing? So we can do a code system lookup on that code. Uh, and what we get back when we do a code system lookup like that, where we haven't passed in any parameters, there is a, a, a number of parameters we can pass in to control the response we get back from the server. In this case, we haven't provided any of those, so the server's allowed to respond with uh, whatever it thinks is the most relevant information to give you. And in this case, it, it is actually fairly relevant. So um, probably the most interesting thing to look at here out of um, all of these properties that's been passed in, you can see that the, um, that the code uh, is inactive. So inactive is true um, for this code. So the code's been inactivated, which is probably why it's not in the map. So one of the interesting, cool, good things about SnowMed CT, which is a bit unusual um, for other code systems, is it actually comes with data in its distributions which tell you about um, replacements or possible replacements for codes that have been inactivated. Uh, and those are actually in the specification as well as um, implicit concept maps. So SnowMed CT has not just implicit value sets in Fire, but it has implicit concept maps as well, which is, which is one of these. And they, they're known in SnowMed CT as um, historical association reference sets, um, maps essentially. Um, and this is what this URL is um, for one of those. It's an implicit concept map. So what we're saying to the server is use SnowMed CT's implicit concept map for historical association to find out what the replacement is if there is one for this particular code in SnowMed. And what it's responded with is, yes, there, there's a match. Um, and in fact, um, there's, there's two matches um, for this particular code. Um, and it's said that the, the relationship here is, is inexact. Um, and we've got one concept here, which is reactive attachment disorder of infancy. Um, if you remember the code before, it was um, of infancy or early childhood. So what's happened to this code is it's been retired and split into uh, one code for infancy, one code for, for early childhood. And that, that's where that's, where that's gone. So um, moving on to um, uh, the, the, the next stage. So once you've collected all this data and you want to do something with it, um, so we'll have a look at, at Glinda Goodwitch. She's a, a researcher and she's looking for treatment pathways for, for mental illness in the, the land of Oz. Um, so she's looking for patients with, with some sort of mental health condition so that she can, she can start to select a cohort. So she starts with all of the, the, um, the SET codes that are descendants of mental illness to, to, to try to select that. However, once she's done that, she sort of sees that she's actually got way too many drunken munchkins, so there's, there's too many alcohol-related uh, mental illness codes that fall underneath that hierarchy. Um, and there's also, she's not really interested in intellectual disabilities for this particular study. So what she's really got to do at that point is make her own value set to define, well, what, are, what is the set of codes that she's interested in? So for making a value set, we've got four key building blocks. Um, we can use uh, criteria that say, we'll include all of the codes in this code system. Um, we can use value sets, so we can say include or exclude all of the codes in this particular other value set. Um, we can use specific codes, so we can just list the codes that we're, that we're interested in, or we can use filters on the properties of the codes. So um, before we looked at there was an inactive property, so we could exclude inactive codes if we wanted to. Um, and on top of that, to give us a bit more expressive power, we've got the ability to use um, sort of and or, or so intersection and, and union. Um, so if you include uh, an, a multiple um, uh, statements together in the one include segment or exclude segment, you're saying and. So in, in an example, um, you want only the members of a particular value set and they must satisfy a, um, a particular filter. Or if you put them in separate includes, you can say, I want everything from this value set as well as things that include this, um, match this particular filter. And just to make the whole thing deterministic, um, we process all of the includes before we process the excludes. So it's a, it's a deterministic result. 
Um, so this is this is the value set that she comes up with. Um, so the first the first code at the top here, she's saying include all things that are mental, some subtype of mental illness underneath this, um, and then exclude the next one is saying exclude um, the intellectual disability codes, all of those. The next bit's a bit of um, expression constraint language from SNOMED CT, um, which is quite a powerful tool, and it's saying. Um, that you want to exclude all mental illnesses, all types of mental illnesses that are, have some sort of association with a drug or medicament, and also exclude the mental illnesses that are associated in some way with alcohol. So ultimately, she can narrow down to very specifically what it is she's trying to say. When we move on to um, Glinda's Fire Server, so hopefully it would be really awesome if Glinda's Fire Server actually supports these kinds of searches. So she can search, the first one here is saying, find me the patients that have um, some condition resource where the subject of that condition is a code that is below or some subtype of um, this particular code, which is again our mental illness code. Um, so she can just go straight to making that query of a Fire Server. Um, now, in terms of how we're going to do that, so um, Glinda's server might have might use the closer operation we talked about before um, to maintain a cache of the subsumption relationship between the codes to be able to join that to its data internally. Might have some virtualized tables that are that are that are doing that in sync um, periodically. Um, the other type of, of query there is finding all the patients that have some kind of condition that um, the code is in a particular value set, so in Glinda's value set. So she's saying, find me all the patients that have a, co a condition that's in this value set. And that's really what she's trying to say. Um, unfortunately, there's no real way to manage that, that nicely like the closure operation does. Um, so uh, there's a few strategies the server could use, but we're running short of time, so I might be able to have to, to go into that later if anyone's interested in that. Um, very quickly, closure operation, because um, I'm short on time, um, is a kind of a, um, a stateful operation that you can have this sort of conversation with the terminology server. First, you initialize it, so you name it, um, in this case, Glinda's closure, um, and the responses from the closure operation are always a, um, a, a concept map that's telling you about the relationships between the codes that you just gave it. In this case, we didn't give it any codes, so there's no relationships to tell us about. Um, the next step, we can pass those those relationship those codes that we were um, that we had in the diagnosis for for um, uh, Dorothy before. So we've got these three codes, um, but of course there's no relationships hierarchical relationships between those codes. So the the answer is still the same from the server. And then finally, we can pass in the mental illness code, um, and now it's going to return back to us that there is a subsumption relationship. In fact. The, um, the mental illness uh, code subsumes the um, depersonalization disorder code that was one of the codes we passed to in the last in the last step and so in a conversational way you can get back those those relationships so ultimately Glinda finds Dorothy um, and she wants to know more about this particular code this RB SLP TAP3 code what it is and maybe what it maps to in SNOMED from her procedure map um, to see if she can understand what this thing is. And ultimately she gets back this response by posting in a bundle to say go and do this lookup and do this translate in one hit for me. Um, and so the, the thing that she gets back from the procedure code is to find out well yes that, that procedure code means tap your ruby slippers three times and say there's no place like home. Um, and then that maps to, in SNOMED CT, uh, a concept called magical thinking. Um, so ultimately, uh, Glinda find, looks into the outcome, finds out that that, that worked really, really well for Dorothy um, and builds a treatment plan around that and, and everyone's really pleased. So what have we been through? Um, hopefully we've been through uh, all of these terminology operations um, and what they mean in fire, so expand. You can look up all the codes that are in a value set and you can search for a particular code, um, you know, responding to some sort of type ahead request that some user's making. You can validate a code, whether it's in a value set, matches a binding that, you, that you're trying to validate data for. You can translate codes from, a, from one code system to another using a translate operation. Um, you can look up codes, so you can look up more data about a particular code and what its properties are. Did a quick example of, of making your own value set. Um, it's a really important part of the spec, and we looked at doing that for analytics to, to try and query out data, but you can obviously want to do that for profiling as well, to narrow down the codes for the particular use case that you've got to make sure you're exchanging the right stuff. 
um, and then talked a little bit about uh, integration of fire and um, terminology servers together and, and the power that you can that you can get from that and that terminology aware search is, is really cool. So yeah, I'll be around um, the rest of the week. I've got a more deep dive into these some of these terminology services coming up tomorrow if anyone wants to go further. Um, but obviously uh, me or Jim um, and I'll be around if, if anyone's interested in um, hearing any more about this stuff. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Dion. Um, we'll take one or two questions, squeeze out one or two minutes here. Uh, Jörg Plöw from Switzerland. I see, uh, I see two problems. One is an issue if you validate display names, I think you have problems with support of different languages. Meaning that if I have a display name in, in German as a sender and the receiver, has the need to display the same code in French, so you cannot validate the display names. You can, obviously, it's optional as to whether you whether you mm -hmm. validate the display name or not. Um, you don't have to pass it, and you don't have to validate it. Um, if the terminology server knows about it, though, um, in the context of the value set that that you've got, um, it can determine what are the valid display names for that. And, and you can actually use code system supplements to, to engage multiple different language translations for a code. Um, so it can, in fact, know that if you give the terminology server that information and that, that use case can be supported. And the second issue is the, the answer of historical relationship. I mean, if I have a patient with, with, with the documents which is 10 years old, what I want to know as a receiver is what the sender meant when he coded, and not that's a relationship which is now split it up in 10 different codes. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, uh, I think it really, there's multiple ways of handling it. This is just an example, I suppose. Um, so the map, for example, could have had that inactive code still in it, mapped to whatever would the appropriate ICD code is for that. Um, obviously, this is just an example, but um, yeah, you can, you would expect to use that original inactive code. You may still want to pass it through those historical association maps, though, to trigger, for example, more up-to-date decision support, um, which is based off the newer codes. Um, so to bring that knowledge forward um, is, is also valid as well. Um. Any other questions? Maybe one more. Okay, thank you. No worries. Thanks. <laughs>